Well, this morning I'm going to talk about a book called Who is the King in America? And I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. Uh, did you know there's approximately five to 6,000 years of recorded human history? Writing was invented around three or 4,000 B.C., Sumerian cuneiform on clay tablets in the Mesopotamian Valley. Today that's Iraq. Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist on his Cosmos TV series, stood in the desert and he said, it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write. So here we have a secular scientist saying, 5,000 years ago, so we're around 2080, so that would be around 3,000 or so BC. And so Egyptian hieroglyphics were supposedly invented around 3,000 BC. Chinese characters called pictograms around 2600 BC, same thing with the Indus Valley. Franklin Roosevelt said 5,000 years of recorded history have proven that mankind has always believed in God, in spite of the many abortive attempts to exile God, but he uses the number of 5,000 years of recorded history. Richard Overy wrote the Times Complete History of the World. He said, no date appears before the start of human civilizations around 5,500 years ago in the beginning of a written or pictorial history. So if we round it out to 6,000 years, uh, 6,000 years is not that long. It's only 60 people living 100 years each back to back. How many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years or close to it? Maybe a grandmother? We're talking 60 grandmothers, and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. It's not that long. But now that we have 6,000 years of records, let's look at them. What do they show? They show there's been a 6,000-year quest to rule the world. So what's one of the first records is Nimrod Tower of Babel, right? The Jewish commentator Josephus said Nimrod wanted to build the tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. And so he made everyone bake bricks and bring them and if he didn't, he would kill him. And so the tower was more or less defiant against God and oppressive over man. And God comes down and confuses the languages and the people scatter. But it's almost like every generation since has tried to rebuild the Tower of Babel. <laughs> but each time it comes around, it's a little bit worse. Because with military advancements, the king can kill more people. So instead of Cain killed and Abel with a rock, now the kings can kill with bronze weapons or iron weapons or a big long phalanx spear that Alexander the Great's men had or a scimitar sword that the Muslims had or gunpowder that the Chinese invented. The weapon improves, but it's that same fallen nature of Cain kill and Abel. But it's almost like every generation since tries to rebuild this. You know, there was a movie years ago, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger called The Terminator, and it's this metal robot killer that was trying to kill these people, and they blow him up. Uh, and then all the little metal pieces melt into little silvery droplets, and then they roll together into this silvery pool. Then out of this pool comes this Terminator, climbs out of that, and starts chasing him again. And everybody in the audience is like, how do you get rid of this thing? Like, how do you get rid of this desire to, to rebuild the Tower of Babel? Well, one of the things I studied is a little bit of science, but it's called... Uh, rate of geometric expansion, the golden ratio, or phi, P-H-I, or the Fibonacci sequence. But you observe it in nature with seashells. It does a little circle, then a bigger circle, then a bigger circle. You observe it in tornadoes and hurricanes and even galaxies. And different people would apply this maybe like to investments. And if your investment is growing at a certain rate, they say, hey, maybe it'll continue at this certain rate and get bigger and bigger. Well, I thought, well, let's look at all the empires in world history and plot them out and see if they sort of follow the same pattern. In other words, that people say history repeats itself. Yeah, but every time it comes around, it's a little bit worse because with military advancements, the, the king can kill more people. So we have Nimrod Tower of Babel. And then around 2500 BC, you have Gilgamesh, king of Uruk. And he's the first one who invented a wall around a city. Somebody had to invent that. And he, um, the oldest story ever written in any language is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And he goes on this long journey to meet this old guy who survived a global flood. Calls it a global flood. 
And actually, over 100 ancient civilizations have flood stories in their ancient past. Anyway, then 2250 BC, Sargon of Acadia conquers a bunch of walled cities, considered the first empire. And then you have 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs and 5,000 years of Chinese emperors. And then around 700 BC, Assyria is the biggest empire on planet Earth. The capital's Nineveh. Remember Jonah went there? And Assyria took the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. But then Assyria was captured by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which was captured by Persia. Right? And then Persia was the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen with Cyrus. And of course, he's the one that let the Jews go back and rebuild the temple. But Persia was conquered by Alexander the Great, who had the biggest empire up to this point. But he stopped from going into India. By, uh, then India has Chandra Gupta and the Mara Empire, and it's the biggest empire, quarter of the world's population. And then around 25 BC, the Roman Empire, the biggest empire the planet had seen up to this point. Augustus Caesar, he actually wanted to have a worldwide tracking system called the census. If he could have had 5G and cell phones and cameras and everything, he would have used that. Um, but then you have the Askamite Empire in Africa, and then Attila the Hun, 450 AD, half a million soldiers. He's wiping out cities across Europe. He's got the biggest empire. And then he stopped from going into the Byzantine Empire, and they have Justinian, and then Islam comes along in the 7th century and conquers from the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean, all of Spain. It's the biggest empire. And then Muslims are stopped from going into France by Charles Martel, and his grandson is Charlemagne, and he controls all of Europe. He's got the biggest empire. And then you got the Vikings come along in the 1,000 and 1,100, and they have both Lochiels, and they conquer uh, this huge empire. And then Genghis Khan, 1,200 AD, conquers from Korea to Hungary, kills 30 million people. He's got the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. And then his son is Kublai Khan that runs China. And then Tamerlane in the 1300s controls all of Central Asia. And then Ivan the Terrible of Russia. And then you cross the ocean, and the same thing is happening in the Western Hemisphere. And you have Montezuma, and he's in control of the Aztec Empire, and they're ripping hearts out of the captured tribes. And then Atahualpa, Inca Peru. And then in the 1500s, the King of Spain has the largest empire that planet Earth had ever seen up to this point. The sun never set on the Spanish Empire. And then in the 1600s, the king of France had the largest empire. Right? He used to control the land that we're on. It used to, have, used to be part of the Louisiana territory, right? And, and then in the 1700s, 1800s, England. The king of England was the most powerful king on planet Earth. He was a globalist. He was a one-world government guy. And you can begin to see why America's founders wanted to break away. They didn't want this globalist king telling us what to do. Now, we plot this, and it keeps growing clearly. You can get the picture that if any one of these guys had not died, they would have been happy to have the world under their thumb. And so it's almost like that spirit of Antichrist would manifest, but at some point it's going to max out with the world. And so in this sense, death is a blessing, and the devil has to start from scratch to try to... Uh, control people. And, uh, but nevertheless, there's this push in that direction. And, now, why does this keep happening? Because it's in each of our own fallen, selfish human nature, right? When Adam and Eve sinned and Cain killed Abel and one king taken a kingdom from another king. Back in the fourth century, you had Saint Augustine, and he called it libido dominandi, the lust to dominate. And so you put some babies in a playpen one of them will take the rattle from the others. And you put some kids on a playground, one's the bully hogging the ball. And you put some junior high girls in a clique, and one of them is the diva. And you put some natives in the woods, one of them is an Indian chief. And you put them in an inner city, one of them is a gang leader. And all a king is, is a glorified gang leader. Right? It's a hierarchical system. If you are friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you are an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason, or you're a slave. Well, I thought slavery started with 1619. No, slavery started with the first time you had a king on top, you had slaves on the bottom. And, uh, and so this is human nature. And so wherever you have humans showing up, they end up setting up this same structure. Now, what if you were the king? That'd be pretty cool. 
And then let's say you have a sister, you really love her, she gets married, has a kid. Now the kid's a teenager. He's hanging around the wrong friends, drinking, partying, and he hits someone with a car and kills them. And now this teenager is facing prison time, man, manslaughter charges, and your sister comes begging to you and says, you're not going to let my little Johnny get locked away, are you? It, it wasn't his fault. Those other kids talked him into it, blah, blah, blah. What are you going to say to your sister? Well, I'll let little Johnny off the hook this time, but don't let it happen again. Guess what? As soon as you say that, you are the corrupt dictator. You just sent ripples through your kingdom that if somebody's family or friends at the king, they get special treatment. And if they're not family and friends, they don't get it. And if someone wants to point out your favoritism, you're going to be embarrassed and be tempted to want to shut them up. So it just happens. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, uh, and so this is like a pull of a magnet, like the law of gravity, like pecking order. Power wants to concentrate. If you ever saw the movie The, Lo the Lord of the Rings, there's a scene where uh, Frodo uh, offers this ring of power to Gandalf. And uh, Gandalf says, always remember, Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Power wants to concentrate. And in the movie written by, or the not novel written by J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, Gandalf rebukes Frodo and says, don't tempt me, Frodo. I dare not take it even to keep it safe. Understand, Frodo, I would use this ring from a desire to do good, but through me it would wield a power too great and terrible to imagine. Now what's he talking about? Every now and then you get a good king, and he wants to concentrate power so he can do good more efficiently. But he doesn't live forever, and at some point that concentrated power gets handed over to some grandson that's a lousy ruler, but he likes his job and he wants to keep it, and so it becomes oppressive of anybody that he doesn't like. What's the Bible example? Joseph in Egypt is a godly man, and he concentrates power into the hands of the Pharaoh. And what did that Pharaoh do with the concentrated power? He fed the children of Israel, gave them the best land of Goshen, gave them jobs taking care of his cattle. But then there was a new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, and he used all that concentrated power to oppress the children of Israel, make them slaves, and even throw their sons in the Nile River. Again, so that's the dilemma. You get a good guy in there, he concentrates it. He's our guy. We let him concentrate power. But at some point, he gets passed over to the next party, and they use it oppressively. And so we see there's a global trend to it. So the same way you have Cain, Kill, and Abel, Nimrod, Tower, Babel, thousands of years of Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsars, clearly there's a global goal. And um, now... Uh, the devil took Jesus to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, all this authority I'll give you, and for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus says, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It's like pretty audacious of the devil to say all these kingdoms are his. When did he get them? When Adam sinned, Adam was in charge of the garden. We know that because he named everything. Naming means you have authority over, right? You have, name, you have kids, you get to name your kids. You got authority over them. But the Bible says, to whomever you yield your members, servants to obey, to him you are a servant. The moment Adam obeyed Satan, he was posturing himself as the obeyer, and the devil is the one who usurped the power. And so all the kingdoms of the world are ruled through fear. And everybody's afraid of the government. And Jesus said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, but ye shall not be so. He that is greatest among you, let him be as he that doth serve. I am among you as he that serveth. So Jesus is pointing out a difference. Instead of a top-down form of government, rule through fear, it's a bottom-up form of government, rule through love and, and serving. So Jesus' kingdom is different than all these kingdoms. Now, in reading through ancient civilizations, I found three things kept repeating themselves. One is people groups would move from hunter-gatherers to agriculture. And even the Bible has the story. Adam and he plucked the fruit off the tree, right? They gathered, but then Cain was a tiller of the soil, agriculture. And so once people groups moved to agriculture, 
they needed to know when to plant the crops. So they needed to keep track of the seasons. So they needed to keep track of the stars. And so they would build big, immovable structures to observe the stars. And Stonehenge, ziggurats, pyramids. And then somebody got to climb up the building, look at the stars changing, would come back down the mountain with this secret knowledge as to when to plant the barley. (laughs) And before you know it, this person claimed to be an intermediary between the heavens and all these lowly creatures below. And his secret knowledge is when to plant the barley, right? And so um, you had these Babylonian Assyrian, they ended up having king priests. And the Egyptian pharaohs claimed to be the son of the god Osiris. And the Roman emperors claimed to be divine and demanded their image be worshipped. And the Chinese emperors claimed that they ruled because they had a mandate from heaven. And the Incan emperors claimed to be delegates of the sun god. And the Muslim caliphs claimed to be successors of the messenger of Allah. And India had rajas, a semi-divine caste of rulers. And Japanese emperors were heavenly sovereigns. And then they Christianized it in Europe and called it the divine right of kings. God chose me to be the king, so whatever my will is must must be God's will because he put me here so I can pretty well do anything I want. And so they called it the divine right of kings. That the creator gives all the power to one person and he dispenses it to all these lowly creatures. And this is the king of France, Louis XIV, the sun king that used to own the land we're on. He said, I am the state. And one time, his administrator said, King, you can't do this, it's illegal. He says, it is legal because I wish it. Oh, okay, I get it. The law is nothing more than the king's wishes, and he just happens to have a really powerful army to make you obey. Here's King James of England, right, Jamestown? He says, kings are God's lieutenants upon earth, sit upon God's throne, The king is the overlord of the whole land, master over every person, having power over the life and death of everyone. Can you begin to see why America's founders wanted to break away from this guy? So the British Empire became the biggest empire on planet Earth. The king of England was a globalist. He was a one-world government guy with him at the top. It took centuries, millennium, for America's founders to break away from a king. And they knew what they were doing. Here is James Wilson, a signer of the Declaration. He said, after a period of 6,000 years since creation, the United States exhibit to the world the first instance of a nation assembling voluntarily and deciding that system of government under which they should live. So he uses the number 6,000 and said something unique happened here. Here is Daniel Webster. He says, miracles do not cluster. What has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. Now, why would there be anarchy throughout the world if America's Constitution fails? Because for 6,000 years, people have suffered under tyrants and dictators and pharaohs and sultans, and they said to themselves, "If, if we could just rule ourselves without a king, wouldn't that be wonderful? And in America, we did it, and if we blow it, there's really nothing left for people to look forward to this side of heaven (laughs) other than another global tyrant. So how did America's government come about? Well, we'll jump into history, and you have Islam, and Islam conquers into Egypt. People forget Egypt used to be Christian. It was evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then Islam conquered into Syria. People forget Syria used to be Christian. The name Christian was first used in Syria until Caliph Umar conquered it. And then it invaded into Turkey, and then it conquered North Africa. People forget there used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa in the 7th century. Boom, all conquered. And then they invaded Spain, and then uh, they uh, invade into what is today Turkey. Back then, it was the Byzantine Christian Empire. So all seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by Muslim Turks. And so the 
Uh, Muslims finally conquered Constantinople, cutting off the land routes to India, and that's when Columbus set sail looking for a sea route, until finally they uh, surrounded Vienna, Austria. And so we have the Muslim Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, and his counterpart is the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V of Spain. So we're talking kings, and the two most powerful kings on planet Earth is the king of Spain and the Muslim sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent. And in the middle of all this, Martin Luther starts the Reformation in 1517. And so the king of Spain has a double dilemma from his point of view. He has a Protestant Reformation on one hand and the Muslim invasion on the other hand. He tries to stop both and can't. And he realizes he needs to make a deal with the Protestants. So it's called the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. It's the first treaty ever to recognize Protestants. And in this treaty is a little Latin phrase that had enormous repercussions. The phrase was, cuius regio eius religio, which means whose is the reign, his is the religion. So in other words, look, Protestant king, believe whatever you want in your kingdom, Let's just work together against these Muslims who are invading because they sort of want to conquer us all. Anyway, so in Europe, it was one Christian denomination per country. What the king believed, the kingdom had to believe. And if you didn't believe the way your king did, it was considered treason, and you were persecuted and you fled. And so northern Germany and Sweden were Lutheran. Switzerland was Calvinist. Scotland was Presbyterian. Holland was Dutch Reformed. Greece was Greek Orthodox. And Spain, Portugal, France, Austria, Italy, Poland remained Catholic, and England Anglican. But again, it was one denomination per country. Prior to this, all of Western Europe was Catholic, but after this Muslim invasion and then this Peace of Augsburg, different kings believed different things. And Europe's thrown into this mass migration of people shifting from one country to another simply for conscience sake. And if you didn't believe the way your king did, you were persecuted, you fled. Well, let's zoom in on England. England had a king named Henry VIII, and he was originally Catholic, and he was married to the daughter of the king of Spain. But after 18 years, she does not have a son, so he decides to divorce her. The Pope won't recognize the divorce, because she is, after all, the daughter of the most powerful guy in the world, And so Henry VIII says, you know what, I'm just going to make myself my own pope. He starts the Church of England, puts himself on as the head, and he goes on to have six wives. And their fates were divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. So Henry VIII was not a really nice guy to be married to. And is this, am I keeping your attention here? Is this interesting? Um, And so Henry had an advisor that says, if you're serious about breaking from Rome, you should stop using the Latin Bible. Get yourself an English Bible. The German princes have Martin Luther's German Bible. You need an English Bible. And Henry says, great, get me one. Well, it just so happens that Henry VIII had William Tyndall burnt at the stake a few years earlier for translating the Bible into English. But now the king wants an English Bible. Did you know William Tyndall's last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes? And so now King Henry wants an English Bible, so they take William Tyndall's work, polish it up, they call it the Great Bible, and they would chain it to the pulpit, and he, because uh, he ordered a copy of it put in every church in England. And it was so valuable, they chained it to the pulpit, and they would like rent time. Your time's up, it's my turn to read. This was the first time the common people of England could read the Bible in their own English language. And uh, so the king was the head of the Anglican church. Well, now that people could read the Bible, there's a group that starts to want to purify the Church of England. And so they're nicknamed Puritans. Well, the king doesn't think he needs any purifying, so he persecutes them. 
There's another group that said it's beyond hope of purifying. We're going to separate ourselves. And they call themselves separatists, right? They call themselves Baptists. They call themselves pilgrims, right? And so the king's attitude was, yes, you can read the Bible in your own language, but no, you can't believe whatever you want. you got to believe what I tell you to believe. I'm still the king. I'm still in charge of what everybody believes. And so they passed the act of uniformity of common prayer. So you do not make up prayers because you could make up one that's wrong. So we've written all the prayers down. And you just open it to the right page and just read the prayer. And uh, then if they caught you having a Bible study with more than five people and you've not gotten approval of the government, they'll arrest you and drag you into a government room for an investigation and detain you. And if you said anything, they would use it against you. And if you didn't say anything, you would be in contempt of court for not participating with their investigation. And then uh, if you refused to answer, they would cut off your ear. They would cut your nose in half. They would brand you on the face as a heretic. And then they passed the Five Mile Act. If you were caught preaching within five miles of a town, you were a criminal, and they would arrest you. Um, Now, one of the persons captured during this time was John Bunyan. He was having a Bible study with too many people, and the police bust in and drag him away. He says, better to be persecuted than be the persecutor. He spent 12 years in prison, and that's when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And one of the early Baptist founders in England was Thomas Hellwise, and he dies as a dissenter in the terrible Newgate prison. And he wrote this, The king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he hath no power over the mortal soul of his subjects to make laws and ordinance for them to set spiritual lords over them. If the king's people obey all humane laws made by the king, our lord the king can require no more. For men's religion to God is betwixt God and themselves. The king shall not answer for it. Neither may the king be judged between God and man. So the attitude was, if the king can stand there on the day of judgment and answer for your conscience, fine, believe whatever the king tells you to believe. But if the king is not going to be there next to you on the day of judgment, you're accountable to God for your own conscience. The kings didn't like that type of stuff. They wanted you to believe what they told you to believe, right? And um, anyway, so these dissenters fled, and so a group of them, who we call the pilgrims, they fled, uh, they, some of them sold their land, bought passage on a ship, and right before the ship left for Holland, where there was some tolerance, uh, the captain robs them, turns them over to the police, they're put in jail. Another group of them arranged for the Dutch ship to come along the shore, the coast, and they would row out on little rowboats. But the pilgrims show up a day early, and it's stormy and wavy, and the women and children say, you know, can we wait on shore? And then the men, the Dutch ship finally comes, and the men row out, and they're storing everything on the ship. And before they can come back and get the women and children, somebody snitched. The British came over the hill and captured the women and children. And the Dutch captain sails away with the men. And you can imagine women and children watching that ship getting smaller and smaller until it disappeared over the horizon. For two years, they passed those women and children from one court in England to another. And in jail, one jail to another. Finally, a judge says, you really didn't do anything wrong, go home. They go, duh, we sold our homes. So just to get them out of their hair, they put them on a boat, sent them over to Holland, and they were reunited with their husbands. Anyway, after 12 years in Holland, the pilgrims decide to flee again, and they're going to come to Jamestown. And they get caught in a storm. It's a 66-day voyage, and it's uh, 3,000 miles, 102 of them. It's, they're tossed to and fro, and they finally get to the coast of America. And they're 500 miles away from Jamestown. And you think, no big deal, just sail down the coast. Well, off the coast of Cape Cod, it's really shallow for a long way out. And it's called the Graveyard of Ships. 3,000 ships have sunk off the coast of Cape Cod. The pilgrims almost sink. The captain goes back to Plymouth Rock and says, forget Jamestown, it's too dangerous to sail. Everyone off the boat. And these pilgrims say, well, we have a question. Who's going to be in charge of us? There's no king-appointed person in our group. And uh, they do something unique. They give themselves the authority to start a government. It's called the Mayflower Compact. And it says... 
we, in the presence of God, covenant ourselves together into a civil body politic to enact just and equal laws as shall be thought most meet or necessary unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in the flow of power. The whole world is ruled by pharaohs and Caesars and Kaisers and sultans and czars, and they're all their administrators. And here in this little bitty Mayflower, in the womb with this little boat, took place the conception of free government, bottom up, government from the consent of the governed. And so it's the difference between a dead pyramid rule top down and a living tree rule that is from bottom up, where every root and every tiny capillary root sucks in nutrients to help keep this tree alive. Difference between divine right of kings and we the people. Now, where did the pilgrims get this idea that they could rule themselves without a king? From their pastor, John Robinson. He was not a king-appointed Anglican pastor. He was a congregationalist pastor. It's this church model where the pastor's job is to get everybody to have their own relationship with God, and then the church is a uh, place where they can grow and mature in their faith and get involved in the ministry, and then at some point, they're going to start sharing the ministry outside of the four walls, and then the body of Christ grows. But it's this idea that everybody's supposed to be involved doing something. And uh, that painting, by the way, hangs in our U.S. Capitol Rotunda. And so they, uh, this was the form of government that they adopted called an assembly or a congregation. It came from the assembly of the Israelites. And Jesus says, upon this rock I'll build my church, and that word church is ecclesia or ecclesia, which is in Athens they had 6,000 citizens, they'd call them all out of their homes, and they would decide what's going to happen in Athens. And so Jesus says, upon this rock I'll build my ecclesia. He's talking about his body. Everybody has a part. Everybody's different, but they all contribute together. Now, the king didn't like this. He liked the hierarchical model because he was at the top. And uh, so the non-conforming pastors had to flee from England. And then when they fled to the New World, um, the pilgrims came over 1620, just a couple hundred of them. The Puritans started coming over in 1630, and they were like, 20,000 Puritans flooding into America. And there were so many of them, they sort of decided that they wanted to change and make it that they were in charge of the government. And so it's okay for them to force everybody to have Puritan uniformity. And so what happened is a bunch of dissenting pastors began to flee again. And you had a Reverend John Lothrop and his church fled and founded Barnstable, Massachusetts. And a Reverend Roger Williams fled and founded Providence, Rhode Island and the First Baptist Church in America. And a Reverend John Wheelwright and his church fled and founded Exeter, New Hampshire. And a Reverend Thomas Hooker and his church fled and founded Hartford, Connecticut. This was unique on planet Earth. At a time when the whole world is ruled by kings and sultans and czars, here you have pastors and their churches forming communities and setting up the government for the communities. And let's look at Hartford, Connecticut. So this is 50 years before Europe's Age of Enlightenment. And um, Puritans said only Puritans could vote. Thomas Hooker said, no, no, anybody that's a Christian should be allowed to vote. Well, that was a big enough deal for him to say, next Saturday, church members meet in the parking lot with all your horses and wagons, and we're leaving. And they went through the woods, and they founded Hartford, Connecticut. And after they're there, they go to the pastor, and they say, Pastor, can you do a sermon on how we're supposed to set up our government? And so he gives a sermon in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid Firstly in the Free Consent of the People. This is reflected in our declaration, government from the consent of the governed. And this is unique on planet Earth because the rest of the world said the foundation of authority is this divine right of kings thing. That the creator gives all the power to this one king and he dispenses it to all these lowly people. And he's like, no, 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 this is the other way around. And he says, the privilege of election belongs to the people. And this is reflected in our Constitution. We the people. Reverend Hooker Sermon said, they who have the power to appoint officers and magistrates, it's in their power also to set the bounds and limitations of the power. His sermon is written down. It's called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. And they use it as their Constitution from 1639 up until 1818. They're using the pastor's sermon. And that's why Connecticut's called the Constitution State. Here's a plaque in England. It says, Thomas Hooker, 
founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Here's another plaque. Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. Here's a statue of Thomas Hooker holding a Bible on the old state grounds in Connecticut. And it says underneath, leading his people through the wilderness, he founded Hartford. On this site, he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first constitution, written constitution that created a government. Here's another plaque in Hartford. It says, Thomas Hooker preached his famous sermon, The Foundation of Authorities Laid in the Free Consent of the People. And then the representatives of the people adopted as the fundamental orders of Connecticut. What do the fundamental orders say? The people can join ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. Sounds like the Mayflower Compact. We covenant ourselves together. Now why? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. In other words, they picked the form of government that would best preserve the freedom of the gospel so that you could believe something without being forced by a king. Here's another plaque in Hartford, and it says, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present Constitution of the United States is modeled. Do you grasp the significance of this? That it's their church government that became the model for the U.S. Constitution? So in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and their churches that created the state. How could you say, pastor, don't get involved in politics when it's his sermon that's their constitution? How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? The word politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means city. So politics is simply the business of the city, and all there was in the city of Hartford were the church members, right? Right? So they basically took their congregational church government and made it their city government. And they actually had the meetings in the church. They called them meeting houses. I mean, why build an entire separate building just to talk about a different subject? And and when the Revolutionary War started, the British military governor, Thomas Gage, outlawed these meetings, these town hall meetings. He said, democracy is too prevalent in America. You don't need the people telling you know, what resolutions, you just tell them to do what the king tells them to do. Calvin Coolidge said the principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found in the sermons of the early colonial clergy. They preached equality because they believed in the fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man. In order that they might have freedom to express these thoughts and opportunities to put them into action, whole congregations with their pastors migrated to the colonies. So these New England pastors were doing an experiment. They realized that the kingdom of God could not be forced by the government from the top down. They were fleeing Europe where kings were burning people at the stake for not believing the way the government did, and they saw that Jesus never forced anybody to follow him. Matter of fact, you read the, the one story, it says that they were, he multiplies loaves and fishes, and there's a crowd following him for a free lunch, wanting to make him king. And it's almost like he says something that he knows will be difficult for them to understand to shake away those following him for the wrong reason. And it says, many disciples walked with him no more. So this is a difficult saying. Jesus didn't run after him and say, oh, you misunderstood me. Or he didn't run after him with a sword and say, get back here or I'll chop your head off. No, he turns to Peter and says, you want to go too? Peter says, where else can I go? You're the one with the words of eternal life. If Jesus never forced anybody to believe in him, we can't. And so these New England pastors says, well, gee, if the kingdom of God's not going to be forced from the government from the top down, how's it going to happen? Well, they thought if the majority of the people held godly values and elected representatives with their values, then laws would be passed reflecting those values, and the values would come voluntarily percolating from the bottom up, not forcibly shoved from the top down. Right? So they're not dominionists, we're going to force it down. No, they believed in representative government. So this is the switch that took place in New England. Instead of creator, king, people, it's the creator gives the rights to every person. And we're all equal, and we choose from amongst ourselves who's going to fix the potholes in the road and who's going to defend against the Indians and so forth. Calvin Coolidge says, placing every man on a plane where he acknowledged no superiors, he must inevitably choose his own rulers through a system of self-government. So, Where did the pastors get these ideas that people could rule themselves without a king? A little from England's Magna Carta, a little from Roman Republic, a little from Athens, but ultimately ancient Israel. 
And so they studied Harvard, uh, they studied Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. And the Constitution was written, it needed to go and have nine states ratify it. They had eight, New Hampshire was in line to be the ninth, and it was going to vote against it. So Harvard President Samuel Langton gives an address to the New Hampshire Ratifying Convention. And it's titled, The Republic of the Israelites, an Example to the American States. Instead of the 12 tribes of Israel, we may substitute the 13 states of the American Union and see this application plainly. After his address, they vote, they ratify it. They're the ninth state to ratify it, and our U.S. Constitution goes into effect. Our U.S. Constitution literally went into effect after the sermon, The Republic of the Israelites an example to the American states. Now, what was the Republic of the Israelites? It was that first 400-year period when Israel comes out of Egypt, around 1400 B.C., and they have no king. So pre-King Saul. And it's a total anomaly on planet Earth, right? When you read the, the pharaohs and the sultans and the czars and the king Agabash and the whole world's kings, and here you have Israel, millions of people, and they come out of Egypt, and for 400 years there is no king. It's the book of Judges in the Bible, a little bit confusing, but it's maximum individual liberty. And so Israel was the first nation where everyone was equal. Instead of you're friends with the king, you're more equal. You're not friends with the king, you're less equal. You're an enemy of the king, you're dead or you're a slave. There was no king. And the law specifically said there is no respect of persons in judgment. Rich or poor, everyone should be treated the same, male, female, made in the image of the creator. This is the beginning of the concept of, of equality on planet Earth. Israel had tolerance. Here they were worshiping the one true God, and they never felt compelled to force anybody. Right? They didn't say, Dra drag your lamb to the temple. Israel was the first nation with private land ownership. You see, wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. It's always conditional of you staying on the nice side of the king. You cross the king, he'll take away the land and kill you. But in Israel, the land was permanently titled to each family. If you own land, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. And you can be moved upon in your heart to voluntarily give away some of your stuff. The Bible called that charity. Israel had no police. Everyone was taught the law. Everyone helped enforce the law. It was like a mom watching a bunch of neighborhood kids. She has no problem with correcting somebody else's kid. In ancient Israel, everybody corrected everybody else. Israel, even the children were taught the law, right? God chose Abraham because he teaches children. Israel had no standing army. You have a king, he has an army to enforce his will. In Israel, every man was in the militia and armed with a sword upon his thigh and was ready at a moment's notice to defend his family and his community. Israel had no prisons. Remember, Joseph was in prison in Egypt for several years. But in Israel, when a crime was committed, you immediately got the accused, the elders, you went to the gates, you had the trial right then. Israel had a bureaucracy-free welfare system. In Egypt, you need food. The government says, we'll give you food, but it's in exchange for your land, your cattle, your children, your lives. In Israel, when you harvested your field, you left the gleanings, the corners, for the poor people to pick through, like Ruth. This way, the poor were taken care of on a decentralized level instead of some political leader collecting it all and doling it out for votes. Israel had a system of honesty. God hates unjust weights and measures, became the basis for commerce, and Israel got to choose their own leaders of their different tribes and villages and so forth. Moses spake unto the children of Israel, how can I myself alone bear your burden? Take you, wise men, and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I'll make them rulers over you. So this was an election process within the tribe. You know the people that hate covetousness, they're honest, you just can't bribe them no matter what, right? And bring them to me. So anyone in ancient Israel could be raised up into leadership. Gideon from a nobody family. Here's Deborah, a woman. She's not related to royalty, it's just her. She knows the law, she's honest. The reputation spreads. People make their way all the way across the country for her to hear their case. You know, she sits under a tree. Where else in the world could a woman become a national leader who's not related to royalty? Harvard President Samuel Langdon finishes, 
the Israelites may be considered as a pattern to the world in all ages of government on Republican principles. From abject slavery, a mere mob, to a well-regulated nation under laws far superior to what any other nation could boast. Think of it, they go from 400 years of slavery they can't even read, and suddenly they, suddenly they get downloaded, the most unique form of government, totally opposite of a king, and it works because every citizen was taught the law. And, and then Israel was the first nation that could read. Sumeria had 1,500 cuneiform characters, but it was only for kings and court records. Egypt had 3,000 hieroglyphic characters, only for pharaohs and court records. Only 1% of Egypt could read. Reading and writing was the scribes' secret knowledge. They kept the hieroglyphs complicated on purpose as job security. They were needed as a class. China had 10,000 characters, only for court records. Only the upper class could read. It was like the deep state could communicate amongst itself and everybody else was in the dark. We had a little of that today in, in America with the pre-Civil War where some of the southern states made it a crime to teach slaves to read. And Frederick Douglass, the Republican advisor to Lincoln, writes in his autobiography of growing up on a plantation and the slave master's sister-in-law was teaching him the alphabet. Her husband walks in, yells at her, says, don't you dare teach slaves to read, it's, Ill it's illegal. Frederick Douglass says that was the first sermon that convinced me that I wanted to learn how to read. And then, um, anyway, so when Moses comes down the mountain, he does not just have the law. He has the law in a simple 22-character alphabet. First letter's Aleph, second letter Beth. So easy to learn. Kids can learn it. Ancient Israel was the first nation on planet Earth where everyone could read. So not only did you get rights and blessings from God, and the law said everybody's equal, you could read the law for yourself and maintain your freedom. And... Um, Harry S. Truman, the fundamental basis of this nation's laws was given to Moses on the Mount, Margaret, Th Sa Margaret Thatcher. The Decalogue, Ten Commandments, are addressed to each person. This is the origin of our common humanity, the sanctity of the individual. Your founding fathers came over with that. They looked after one another, not only as a matter of necessity, but as a matter of duty to their God. There is no other country in the world that started that way. And so, in ancient Israel, think of the... Of all government power, one side you got uh, power concentrated into the hands of a king, and the other, there's power separated into the hands of the people. But with, uh, if powered in, with just the people, it could be anarchy. And so kings rule through fear, but the republics are ruled through virtue. And so the people need to have morals. And so what they did is they took the power of the king and they separated it into the hands of the people. It would be anarchy, except that every person was taught the law. I was trying to think of a way of explaining this. Imagine you have an app on your phone that's GPS that gives you directions. Imagine an app that would tell you how to behave. A behavioral app in real time. It would say, now don't steal that and don't lose your temper at that person. And the Levites are the computer geeks that help you to download the app. Right? And then the big question is, why would you follow it? What would motivate you to follow an internal moral? Ancient Israel had the key ingredient. There is a God who is watching everyone. He wants you to be fair, and he's going to hold you accountable in the future. So you're about to steal. Nobody's around. They think God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. And it creates something in your head called the conscience. If everybody in the country really believes this you can maintain complete order with no police. Maximum liberty. Now, God knew the Israelites would sin, and so rather than them walk around the rest of their life with a guilty conscience, once a year they had the Day of Atonement, and everyone's sins were forgiven for the past year. And um, I'm, I'm uh, out of time, but I just wanted to uh, go through this one last part. If we get rid of God, we get rid of the law, get rid of virtue, and have these kids come out of schools and there's no right, there's no wrong, they don't even know if they're a boy or a girl anymore, and they're totally lawless, then people are going to have chaos and they're going to want a king. Uh, and so you have what happened with Israel. The high priest, Eli, stopped teaching the law. You think he stopped teaching it? Yeah, his own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent where the Ark of the Covenant is. And then you got another terrible story of a Levite with a graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. And then the tribe of Dan comes along and takes the graven image and tells the Levi, hey, come along and be a, you can be a priest to our whole tribe. And you're thinking, what's this priest doing with the graven image? Isn't that one of the commandments? He's not following those. 
And then the terrible story of a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite's to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with the woman he's not even married to. And the poor girl's raped by a bunch of sodomites. Something about that behavior that appears at the last stages of a people ruling themselves. And when you get grossed out by the story, you read this line, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because the priests had stopped teaching them what was right in the Lord's eyes. They lost the knowledge and fear of God. They lost the knowledge of God's law. All they had was their selfish human passions, and it turned into robbing and stealing. And then they all say, we want somebody to come along and fix this mess. And sure enough, they get a King Saul. And Samuel cries, and the Lord tells Samuel, they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. And then Saul is pouting that his son, Jonathan, became friends with David. And he turns to his soldiers and he says, none of you soldiers care about me. And um, Doeg the Edomite says, I care, king. I saw David go to this town and the priest gave him some bread and the sword of Goliath. And Saul says, bring those priests to me. They show up, he turns to his men and says, kill them. The men hesitate. Doeg the Edomite goes out there and kills them all. What just happened? The soldiers had been operating under the old system where every person is accountable to God to follow the law. And the law says you need two or more witnesses before you condemn someone to death. There's only one witness, Doeg. And so the soldiers are hesitating. They still have a conscience. You're telling me to kill and I'm accountable to God. And the law says, there Doeg says, King, I'm going to surrender my conscience to you. You tell me to kill, I'll kill. You tell me to kill the baby in the womb, I'll kill it. You tell me there's no more male and female, fine. You tell me to, to do stuff to, to my body that I don't want. You are, I'm going to surrender my conscience to you. You blow your trumpet and I'll bow to your statue. Kings always want to insert themselves between you and God. Tyrant governments always want to insert themselves between, between you and God. And God is jealous. He doesn't want the government between you and him. He wants a personal relationship with you. And so, anyway, um, someday, uh, someday you'll be dead, and you'll be in heaven, and you'll be, uh, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing his praise than when we just begun. Imagine you've been in heaven 10,000 years, and you're walking the streets of gold, and you meet Moses. That'd be pretty neat. Maybe Moses invites you over to his place. I don't know what it's like in heaven, but Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions, so I bet Moses will have a pretty nice place. He'll probably have one of those big fireplaces where the logs don't burn up. Get it? The burning brush in the wilderness didn't burn up and the logs in his fireplace. I heard one preacher say, in heaven you'll travel as fast as you think, and I'll probably show up late. And my wife will say, where were you? I was, I was thinking about something else. And, um, but imagine being there, and Moses has a big living room, maybe like today, and uh, maybe he's sitting in front of you, so you tap him on the shoulder and say, Moses, tell us a story again. What was it like? I, I read the book. I even saw the movie. But here you are in person. The room will get quiet, and Moses will stand up, and he goes, you know, I was 80 years old, and it looked hopeless. The Pharaoh, the most powerful military leader in the world, was charging in at us with these chariots, and we were totally unarmed. And I just stood there with my staff. I said, God, use me to deliver your people. And the waves came in and swallowed up Pharaoh's chariots. Then we're going to see David. Say, David, tell us your story. The room will get quiet. David will stand up. I was just a teenager. This giant thug, Goliath, was mocking our God, and these grown-ups were too chicken. And I said, enough of that. Took my little sling, hit him in the head, and took his own sword and chopped his head off. And one by one, they're going to tell all their stories. It's going to be really exciting. And then everyone in the room is going to look at you. You, you we, we haven't heard from you yet. What's your story? What was going on down on earth when it was your turn to be down there? What were they saying about the baby that the Lord knew in the mother's womb or or marriage that God himself instituted in Genesis? Or what did you do when the whole world was against you? What did you do when it looked scary and hopeless? And they're all on the edge of their seats waiting to hear. You know, I'd hate to say, well, you know, I, uh, I threw some a couple bucks in the offering plate, or, you know. And I want to say, man, let me tell you, that they, the country was looking really bad, and I said, I didn't, enough is enough, I'm going to let the Lord use me. And... Um, you know, I'd hate for any of us to be up there and for, for, uh, for Jesus to walk in the room and him to have a screen come down with all kinds of great things and people coming to the Lord and him saying, uh, this is what I had planned for you to do, but you just didn't have enough faith. And, and you look back at your life and you see that uh, the big 
mountain that held you back from doing stuff for the Lord, you look back, it was just a little ant hill. That fear of man, what are people going to say about me? You said, I let that little ant hill hold me back from doing all those great things for the Lord. But guess what? We're still on this earth. You still can do those things that you'll be known for forever. This is an exciting time to be alive. That out of the 6,000 years of recorded human history, the good Lord decided for you to be alive right now. He's entrusted us with a great country where we can rule ourselves from bottom up. I don't have time to, to get into all these slides, but I just wanted to find one here at the end. So I went through you know, all the world history and how they're all kings and America's founders broke away and, and we made the people the king. And, and, um, and so uh, the word citizen is Greek. It means co-king. And, uh, and then, let's see here. Um, I like this one where... So in America, you get to be the king of your life. You get to decide where you want to live, who you want to marry, and you have the opportunity of willingly submitting your life to Jesus, the King of Kings. And it says, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And Jesus has made us kings and priests to his Father. And what do we do anyway? We throw our, our crowns at his feet, right? So I'll end with that. Hopefully this was interesting for you today and inspiring. God bless you. God is in control. Jesus is our king. And the word of God is our instruction booklet. And we are going to follow God. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. So this is an introduction to some things that uh, we want to make you aware of. And uh, if you came here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, it's the greatest decision that you could make. If there's any other decision, a rededication of life, uh, follow the Lord in baptism, uh, join the church, whatever, uh, you know, God speaks to you about, we want to give a time of invitation before we go. So would you stand to your feet? Father, I thank you for your word. And God, we need to defend the word of God. God, it is our Bible. It is your living word. And God, I pray that we will stand up for what is right. God, I pray that you would just use us as your voice. God, we need to be your hands and we need to be your feet. We need to be your eyes. So God, I pray that you would just do a work in our lives. God, we love you. We praise you. And God, I pray that if, again, someone needs to be saved, give their heart and life to Christ, today would be that day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If God has spoken to you in any way, if you want to come to the front and pray, whatever you need to do, would you come?